Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I am talking to Beth Brennan today and today you are being kind of introduced to another segment of the podcast. So this is one of the first that will ever go out and hopefully you guys really enjoy it. I'm very excited to release this to you and also excited to talk to Beth today who is a competitor and that is what we're going to be all about today. Kind of competing, talking to competitors, what they do um, to give you a bit of insight into their world um, rather than always talking to experts and kind of diving into that which we also love but also getting more specific towards those who compete. So uh, Beth is a bikini competitor um, and recently did really well in the UK DFBA. Uh, but without me kind of going over things too much, kind of introduce yourself, Beth, who you are, what you do, and your competitive background. That would be brilliant. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, Steve, for having me on the podcast. It's um, very nice to be invited. Um, yeah, so I compete with the UK DFBA. I am the current UK DFBA bikini champion, um, British champion. I did go on to compete in the world championships um, last year, but didn't make the top, unfortunately. Um, before that, I have also competed with the PCA and UK BFF. I've competed on and off for about five years now. Cool. Um, I tend to do quite a few in one year and then have a couple of years off and then <laughs> the, te- the standard cycle. Um, and I'm also an online coach and personal trainer myself. Awesome. And I'm sure we dig into kind of the not competing and then competing again because I actually think that's very interesting. But initially, I just wanted to ask kind of what was your background before competing? What got you into the sport? What made you want to do bikini? Um, When I was about 18 years old, I actually developed anorexia um, and I battled with an eating disorder for about two years um, into university. When I went to university, I did a dance and fitness degree. So during my fitness part of my degree, we learned about personal training, nutrition, things like that. And I actually got my qualification through there. So when I was doing that, I was kind of in the gym more and I had a trainer at the gym who kind of said to me, you know, you need to eat a little bit more. And I was one of those girls who was like, I really want abs, but I also Mm. want to grow my bum. And he's like, well, you've got to eat. And I was like, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Um, And then through that, I kind of learned and educated myself and built a bit of muscle. And then I just saw girls on Instagram who when I used to when I first started lifting in the gym it was very rare to see girls in the gym never mind girls with abs and I thought this was like a unicorn thing I was like I want that is this real can this be achievable and someone there was actually a woman in one of the gyms I trained at who was a bodybuilder so I kind of sheepishly went up to her and was like can you help me (laughs) and she said yeah so I kind of went from there really and just door straight in Amazing. And well, thank you for being honest about kind of the the past eating disorders and things. I know it can be kind of not a a fun subject to talk about, but it's really interesting because I think probably a lot of competitors, I doubt many competitors would say they've got like the best relationship with food and they've always had an amazing relationship with food because I think a lot of us get into it from that angle. So um, I just think it's interesting. I don't obviously it's like an outlet for control for a lot of people, but I think the good thing for yourself is that it's been very positive and productive and oftentimes people see it feeding a disorder but obviously for you it's allowed you to compete and grow a business and really love the sport yeah um without sounding huge Mike it kind of saved my life really because I know in myself if I'd have tried to do it another way so in a way that was out of my comfort zone and in a way that I didn't like what I saw in terms of oh I'm just going to eat what I want and put on weight and I'm going to force feed myself I would have just have continued to cycle forever but because I found this sport that I could use my kind of control over food in a positive way to mm-hmm. eat more and to eat well and to build instead of kind of do it because I hate myself <laughs> basically um it kind of I turned it into a positive addiction instead of a negative one mm-hmm. fantastic and I think Something that I think would be really beneficial for the listeners to hear about is you obviously talked about competing not every year, kind of you compete on and off. 
Uh, a lot of, I think a lot of females try and compete very regularly and you found obviously you're very successful to not compete every year. How, how do you balance that and what are your reasons for it? Well, the first year I competed, I think I competed about five times. Um, I did a show. I hadn't even been to see a show. I just kind of turned up, nearly missed my stage time because I was too busy in the toilet talking to people. <laughs> um and came, I think I came seventh. And then because I had the bug and because somebody in the audience who was a coach was like, I think I could probably bear, basically. Um, I hopped into a another show about a month later um, and did bring a better condition. But again, my feedback from the first show was I don't have enough muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. But then four weeks, you're not going to grow any muscle tissue. I just looked leaner. So my condition was better, but I didn't take on board what the coach, what the um, judges said to me. Um, so obviously came off stage from that, placed better. I think I placed fifth, um, but still took the feedback and thought, okay. So now that I had this coach, he said, we'll have a couple of months off. So I think I took about two, three months off, which again wasn't a long period of time, but having somebody there, to make sure I was eating enough during that period really helped. And then I came back and competed again. I actually competed, I think it was the Sugars Classic. Okay. So the UK BFF one that's just after the finals that qualifies you for the finals the year after. Okay. Um, and came second. So um, from there, obviously, I had a whole year until I had to compete ever, like again um, because I only had to do the final. So I took a year to build again um and when it came to the finals i actually decided i was going to prep myself which didn't go very well mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um i didn't enjoy finals because i hadn't i didn't get into the condition i wanted and to be honest it really put me off mm -hmm. um but again it was my own fault it was a learning curve um i thought i could just copy what i did last time but I, you're never the same yeah. no is ever the same um so because i didn't enjoy it i kind of put off doing it again and had about two years off and kind of worked on building muscle and um metabolism and strength and things and just enjoyed training for a while um then met my coach in the gym that i now work in and after a couple of months kind of was like i think i would like to do it again but can you help me? And he said, yeah. So. Cool. Now, I guess something that I at least took from that was um, you found having someone to be accountable to and a coach, obviously you'd gone through it yourself. You kind of felt like you had the, the knowledge and the understanding of how to prep yourself. But at the end of the day, just having someone to check in with, to keep you accountable was really beneficial. Yeah. Having a coach, it's, I think any coach can say this, you know, um, you know how to mold somebody else, but it's about what goes on in your head. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you push yourself too hard. Sometimes you don't push yourself hard enough and you just need that person to either pull you in or push you harder at the right time. And some, when you get into a certain condition, you never see how you actually look. Sometimes you're very critical of yourself yeah. and you need that eye just to be like, no, you're on track or actually we'll speed it up a bit. Um, things like that but I do believe that I always say this to girls especially if you're natural and especially if you want to do things like bikini that two years I had off when I consciously built mm -hmm. the difference in stage pictures are just ridiculous um, and I wouldn't have made that change if I only had a couple of months off and it's you definitely you need it mm -hmm. You yeah, do. I think people always underestimate the amount of muscle mass you need as a bikini competitor. They kind of look at them and they think, oh, they're just kind of lean. Yeah, but the actual amount of muscle mass you need under there and the condition now that you have to bring is just, I mean, it's next level. It's its not bikini like you see on the beach. It's like, actually, these are true out and out competitors. Uh, you're not going to get there just by kind of, yeah, just winging it. Yeah, 
COVID challenge, yeah. No. <laughs> Brilliant. So in terms of, I think it'll be interesting to hear about, obviously, that two-year off-season and your training now. What's, what are your general kind of training philosophies? Do you focus on particular lifts or what do you do kind of to build the physique you've got? In, and I can be more specific in terms of like volume, frequency, intensity. I don't know how much you want to go into it, but if you have a general philosophy there. Um, at the minute, I'm not... Um in kind of too much of a building phase just because I won't be competing for a couple of years mm -hmm. now. Um, I'm getting married and things like that. So <laughs> so at the minute, I focus more on strength and performance. So it's slightly different to what I would do in, for example, bikini off-season. Yeah. In my off-season, um, when I started with my coach, Zach, um, I do Y3T training. Okay. So Y3T is um, a principal training created by Neil Hill mm -hmm. and it's got four week cycle. So week one is more of a strength week. Um, week one is split into two parts. So week one A, <laughs> just remember I haven't done it a couple of months. Week one A is um, repetition range is of about five to eight and you focus more on compound lifts. Mm -hmm. You don't focus on eccentric as much during that time, but you just make sure that you're controlling the weight um, and that you're not just flinging it about. Um, so week one B is a four second eccentric repetition range is from eight to 12. So it's very slow, very controlled cool. again, mainly bigger exercises and not as many of them in the session because you do four sets of each exercise, okay. four second eccentric on each one. It takes longer <laughs> and it puts a lot of stress onto your body, obviously yeah. with these tricks. Um, Week two is more of a hypertrophy style, so it's three second eccentric um, repetitions from 14 to 18, and then week three is a volume week, so it's anything from 20 to 30 repetitions, Ooh. or a drop set, or a giant set, or a super set. Um, and every day it's kind of different body parts, but I focus more on legs than anything because mm -hmm. being a bikini girl it's something that you look at so i'll have about three leg sessions a week okay. and then two to three upper body sessions cool no really i mean i i'm sure a lot of the listeners will have heard of i mean neil um surely they've heard of yoda his training and everything and i think it's just nice to hear that obviously you have a plan and it's well thought out and i guess was the fourth week kind of like a deload period so there's like fatigue management there as well no, um, week, the four weeks, so oh, week I... one is split into two. Okay, I didn't so that's kind of like a lower volume period there, I guess, to manage yeah. it. It's, it's got um, undulations and things, so no, interesting, uh, it's really cool. So and then in terms of nutrition, how does that look? What's your kind of approach there? Do you utilize, like, do you track things or off-season and kind of during comp prep, do they look very different? My off-season um, I and prep, I had a plan. So my coach just sends me what he wants me to eat and I just kind of eat it. Um, obviously, off-season's a bit more flexible in terms of if I have social events at the weekend, go for it. Yeah. Um, sometimes he'll tell me, like, go have a date night, do something fun. Because when you're in prep, you won't be able to do as much. Um, and then prep as well just tells me what to eat and I just eat it. But it kind of takes – I like that because it takes the thought process away mm -hmm. from the whole thing. So if someone says, you know, you've got – X amount of calories and it's quite low sometimes that messes with your head more because you think oh my god I'm so hungry I'm only yeah. eating this much whereas if you just put a meal in front of you and you just eat it you don't really think if it's big or little or whatever mm -hmm. um, I do macros at the minute okay because I spent I think last year I was on prep on and off since January to mid-November so a long time <laughs> a bit of macro <laughs> macro playing around with at the minute but normally um with my coach he just tells me what to eat and i just do it basically mm -hmm. yeah i think especially for contest prep periods when there's so many different variables and the physique's very kind of in flux a lot of the time it's nice to have things under control and again like you said i mean the take home is probably the stress element of not having to think about it you just take in what is on the meal plan yeah, I'm quite. I'm not really a person who craves a lot either. I don't really need cheat meals, cheat meals, 
Um, so a lot of the time, if there is a have a meal out, I'll say, do I go, what should I have? Right. <laughs> He'll say to me what to have. And I'd like, have that. I'm like, okay. I'm not one of those people who kind of craves things very often. Mm-hmm. And it's nice also you touched on kind of off season you have more flexibility there. So like imagine, I don't know, following a meal plan your entire life, I guess, isn't necessarily sustainable, but you can follow it for periods of time where it makes sense. And then when you can back off, like you said, you've got a wedding this year and things, you can be a bit more flexible and enjoy that. Do macro this year instead. So I can yeah. eat macro. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then I guess we kind of somewhat alluded to it. You talked about kind of prepping January to November. What's your typical contest prep length if you have one? Um, and has it changed? Um, I don't have a typical one. I think it depends on what condition you start in, really, um, if you're natural or not, um, how well you know your body and how well you know it reacts. If you've done a cut previously and you know you can lose fat really quickly, um, your body type, things like that. If you've worked with your coach before and if you haven't, obviously if they're new, I would recommend a longer period of time because there's going to be a phase where you're just trying things out. Yeah. Um, but again, every single prep is always different. So your body never reacts exactly the same every single time in my experience. So in my recommendation, as long as possible, really, because the longer you give yourself, the less stress you have and the more you can kind of try things and speed it up if you need to or slow it down if you need to. Um, and that last kind of three or four weeks, the condition that you can get in the last like three weeks is ridiculous. Yeah. To the rest so that extra two weeks could just be the winning spot for you so i would say as long as possible without being like a whole year for mm-hmm. one the only reason i was in prep for basically a year was because i did pca first and then while i was prepping for pca finals decided to do uk the fba in the middle and then prep longer because I then got to the world yeah <laughs> so I wasn't planning on being in prep for a year it just kind of happened <laughs> yeah these things I the same thing happened in my last comp prep where I didn't expect to go to finals or to qualify for finals and then I ended up going because yeah. well if you qualify you kind of want to get there and this I think as you get more experience I guess now you know you're at that standard where you will be competitive to go to finals you could be a bit more strategic about where you might do shows and things like that because like you said there is kind of like more time but at a point becomes if you have so much time you can't really maintain it so you need to be a bit kind of strategic and plan for it yeah and you just end up apologizing to everyone (laughs) yeah (laughs) The so hanger. Right, sorry. <laughs> like, just one more comp, just one more, and then I'm done. <laughs> that kind of thing. Cool. And a question um, people always like to hear about, and I don't know if um, how deeply you want to get into it, but kind of a peak week approach. Have your peak weeks again look very different, or do you have a typical approach to that with your coach? They're always different, to be honest. Um, even this last year, I think all my peak weeks were different Mm -hmm. we don't do anything crazy we do tend to do a little bit of a water load and then a cup and same with carbs just tighten me up a little bit and then refeed me that for i think it's more because mentally especially because it's so talked about everybody thinks oh i'm gonna get loads of carbs the day before and Mm -hmm. oh i'm gonna get a glass of wine the day before so if your coach says no you're not some people start to like go crazy like what (laughs) I expected this (laughs) so sometimes the low carb days are just so you can have the extra refeed to kind of mentally kind of calm you down and just make you feel like I'm filling up for comp day Um, but when we went to for example when we went to the Worlds we flew I think was it two days before the show so that day obviously kept carbs quite low just because of the flight Mm -hmm. 12 hour flight Lots of chances of water retention. <laughs> Lots of chances of me stressing about water retention the whole time. <laughs> um, but apart from that, um, the two days afterwards when we were in America is pretty normal. Um, I think once you're in condition, you're kind of in condition. Yeah. So uh, it, you're not going to change massively. No, I think that's really refreshing to hear. In that, like, you don't. There is no magic tricks there. You've you've done incredibly well, and you haven't used any there. And it's just keep it simple. And I completely agree. A lot of the time it is somewhat overhyped and kind of people need that psychologically to do something different because things are different so no really nice and I guess we got to then post-competition obviously you're you're well out of competitions now what's that kind of look like 
Uh, obviously, people are probably aware of like recovery diets, reverse diets. What has your approach been? Um, I didn't have a kind of crazy reverse diet this time around because actually after I did the British finals, <laughs> because I've been in prep for so long, I was debating whether I was going to do the Worlds. Okay. Just because it was going to be another six weeks of prep and I was so tired and, and I'd gone ill and I'd told, I'd promised everyone like, this is the last <laughs> one. And then I was just backtracking on myself. So my coach just gave me three days kind of off Mm -hmm. Um, because I was in condition anyway really Um, three or four days I think it was and he said you know really really think about this Um, and he gave me I think it was about 2,000 calories something like that Um, and just gave me the the macros and said just have three days to eat what you want and during that week I think I actually only put on about a pound or less than that I can't remember I didn't put on a lot so he said you know we've done this now so we know your body can jump back straight into that and nothing will happen. So I didn't really need to. He just kind of said, right, we know what your body's like. Whoop, calories back up. Mm-hmm. Enjoy yourself. Here's some macros. Just chill out. Um, plus, we were in America for two days. Yeah. So. <laughs> the food's pretty damn nice in America, yeah. <laughs> so um, so not, not really. We mm-hmm. didn't need to. But that's because, again, I'd been coaching with him for over a year by that point. So we tried things before. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really need one, so we didn't. Cool. Have- no, it's really interesting to hear. Again, it's like one of those things where you need to try things, you learn yourself, and again, going through it with a coach allows you to have the data there and kind of really know yourself. So that's really interesting. Um, and then kind of final few questions. Yeah. In terms of outside of competing, what other things, obviously you coach and stuff, um, is there anything else you like to do kind of in your off season that, I don't know, other sports or other things you're into, other hobbies, or are you all out and out bikini all the way? Um, this year, I've kind of, I say that we're only just in January, but um, this time round, um, because I know I'm going to be in a period for quite a long time, I've used it to do different things. So I've started running. Cool. Um, I do actual strength training days, so like five sets of five, um, long rest periods, nothing crazy, things like that. Um, whereas before it would just be kind of hypertrophy style strength. Um, I do yoga now. Um, I tried a CrossFit class the other day. Things like that. I and we do. I do AMRAPs and things like that. Okay. Um, more kind of high intensity fitness related cardio instead of cardio for calories. Um, so yeah, I do a bit of everything at the minute. I'm just trying. I've got the energy, so yeah. And use it, sir. Nice. No, really cool. And then in terms of like future aspirations, where do you kind of see yourself like in a number of years? Do you have any future goals or things you want to achieve? Um, currently, I'm just business focused at the minute. Um, I would love to come back to obviously the UK FBA if I ever do compete again and gain my title again because... I'm not going to challenge it this year, so mm-hmm. it's going to be taken. <laughs> so I'd love to come back and get it again and be like, I still got Somewhere. it. <laughs> um, but at the minute, I think it is just general. I focus on all my clients now, and I've got a couple of them competing, so it's kind of about them this year. And my goals are more semi-short term in terms of I just kind of want to get stronger and feel fitter, mm-hmm. be more um, an all-round athlete instead of just I kind of look really lean. But cool. I can't lift anything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some power lifting? Yeah. Um, I would, but there's a couple of lifts I can't do just because of past injuries. Ah. Uh, That'd be a bit blocked. Yeah. But I'm going I'm gonna compete, but I only want to do these two lifts. <laughs> yeah. It would be a bit although I'd love to. It looks really cool. So. No, yeah, definitely. Uh and then the final thing is just for kind of new competitors, new timers, what would be kind of your one kind of big lesson or big takeaway? Something you wish you knew before you started? Um, get a coach. Don't try and do it on your own as much as you're a personal trainer, as much as you have 10 friends who are all compete and are going to give you different different pieces of advice. No matter how many books you read, um, you can have all the knowledge, but trying to put it into place when you're not 100% sane, which you won't feel at parts, you'll be overly emotional, overly attached to your food and your body and what you do. Um, just get somebody who you trust. Get them before you compete. So don't get them and be like, I'm going to start prep tomorrow. Because that off-season pre-prep phase is just as important 
working with your coach and working with your body as the prep phase is. So, yeah, get a coach, get them early, and work with them really well. And be honest, you know. Uh, people who aren't honest with their coaches, that's why things go wrong, I think, because there's two different levels of understanding. And if you're both on the same page, then it's so much easier to work together. Fantastic. And I love that element of honesty as well. It's so important. And I, I think probably part of that is and this would be a whole nother discussion I'm sure we could have is you need to (laughs) find a find a coach you can be honest with because I think some people feel like they can't be honest with their coach and if you feel that way you probably need to find another one exactly no I think I agree and then if people want to find more about you Beth maybe find something about your coaching or more just about what you're doing or like with your off season now where should they head I have a YouTube channel as well so um, I have YouTube, um, Beth Brennan Fitness. I have my Instagram, which is B Brennan Coaching. And apart from that, I'm on Facebook, that kind of thing. But probably more Instagram and YouTube is where I put my content out. Fantastic. I'll make sure that's all linked below. I want to thank Beth for a fantastic interview. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. If you have any questions or anything, well, Beth has in, uh, YouTube, so you can comment below and she's going to have to cover them all now. Um, only joking. Um, thank you, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.